welcome Seaweed Nerds to the inaugural um, podcast and vlog for Seaweed Generation. I'm here with Dr. Duncan Smallman, um, who is the co-founder of Caledonia Seaweed, who support uh, newcomers and um, folks who are interested in the seaweed aquaculture and harvesting businesses, um, both to help them understand how to get started and um, in the longer term to what to do with their seed once they have grown it. So welcome Duncan, thank you for talking to me today. Um, oh, you're very welcome, thank you for having me. Um, pleasure. It's all right, call you Paddy? Uh, yes. On this? <laughs> um, so uh, Duncan and I have been nerding out together about seaweed for uh, a while now, but um, I've asked him to do more of an official chat with me to um, just kind of condense his knowledge and enthusiasm for seaweed into a format that I can share with other people because um, the whole purpose of this is to share the love of seaweed. Um, so uh, Duncan, my first question for you, which actually I don't think that we've talked about in any of our calls, is um, can you describe to me the first like aha moment that you had with seaweed where you just suddenly felt like it should or could be a very great thing um, in the world? Um, I can't give you an aha moment because I grew up eating nori like and wakami because I was born in Japan and uh, the culture uh, it's seaweed is just there it's part of the cuisine and when we came and because I'm actually because I'm allergic to egg and chicken I ended up and there's a lot of egg and chicken over there I ended up eating a lot of seafood I grew up eating well rice bananas um salmon well fish and seaweed and so when we came back I've always just known eating nori is good for you and my mum always said it's better for you than spinach which turns out to be true it's it is so there was no real aha moment it was more I've always grown up eating it and I've always assumed that it's only kind of people with the more of association with eating uh, either the, the far eastern uh eastern asia cuisine um the oriental cuisine that might sort of be more readily eating seaweed so when i was doing uh, my undergrad and um postgrad and stuff um i never really considered trying to sell seaweed to people over here because i was so used to people kind of at school and turning their nose up at it going oh what are you eating and then trying it and just going Ugh, or something so I, I never I knew that there had been a cultural that there had been historic uses of different seaweeds here um but I never thought that it was going to get popular and then it suddenly did and uh, enticed to start working with seaweed again because of the movement uh yeah so who um lock fine oysters they were back in 2013 so i had moved to easdale and we were looking at other things that could be done on the island um or the area and because there's a large number of oyster farmers up there we were looking actually at oyster hatchery we had already looked considered a i had already looked into starting a lobster hatchery but it wasn't economically viable and so we we're looking at doing an oyster hatchery and so i went to talk to lost lock fine oysters and they said no 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 don't bother with that look into seaweed do you have this growing here and it was alaria esculenta also known as what they call it atlantic wakame i was like yeah we've got lots of it because as a marine having studied marine biology like my favorite place is the seashore so i used to go down to the seashore a lot just to enjoy it um and nerd out and just go oh look at this um usually uh anyway so i started looking into doing wild harvesting um there and that, that was when i discovered that there were new food companies starting and that there was this starting trend of uh people wanting to eat um eat different seaweed species and use them and of course this was actually entwined with the increase in interest in the foraging movement and uh yeah, that was kind of when I went, okay, well, I grew up eating seaweed, so this seems like a natural, a normal, natural kind of thing to do. Let's, I'm, I'm quite keen to encourage people to eat it because I can see that it's a veg, it's not a vegetable, but you could, uh, you know, you could, yeah, 
it's like a sea vegetable and I, I knew it was good for me anyway um interested in seaweed for food yeah it's my my main interest is eating <laughs> that's perfectly reasonable um so can you can you de uh, dig a bit more into kind of you know obviously i think it's delicious my kids were walking around with seaweed for breakfast this morning because they absolutely love it too um mostly nori um oh, nori's so good so good <laughs> Especially when they cover it in soy sauce as well. Um, could you dig in a bit more to the the food stuff and kind of how you see the? You, you said that you know kids turn their nose up at, at school, but can you talk uh, talk a bit to how you see um, attitudes towards it changing? What you see it being kind of eaten um, as and used for at the moment? Okay. Well, yeah. Um, it's got so the. Ah, how to do this in concisely um the attitudes are changing because a lot more chefs are using it and publicly using it on tv and promoting it and uh, i worked with a company previously called mara seaweed and so i kind of always plug them i like them um and they do, did it as seasoning they were look, going for the health benefit of going well look it's actually a low salt you get the same kind of saltiness from it without it being high in sodium chloride i mean it still has sodium chloride but it's mainly potassium chloride so it's it's kind of like a healthier salt alternative but for me as well, right? that's a bit of a fallacy some species have a bit higher umami but they're not anywhere near as high as say like marmite cheese or um mushrooms mushrooms are really rich in umami um never put mushrooms in vodka it just becomes an intense flavor some seaweeds do have a bit more Amami, but it's meant to be a bit of a though it was identified in some of the far eastern species it's not necessarily true for all seaweeds so like oh, the various uses i don't know um i i like I, I mean i like nori i mean i like the idea of bringing back some of our old old the the kind of the cultural uses um so in ireland they still actually eat dulse which is a lovely red broadleaf seaweed. Um, and that's that's quite tasty. That's the one that's sometimes featured in uh, articles as the seaweed that tastes like bacon. Because if you fry it fresh or even fry it dried, it actually does have quite a meaty bacony flavor. Lava, which is kind of equivalent of our of uh, our equivalent of nori. You know, there are so many uses, don't turn it into lava bread. Um, I'm sorry, Welsh listeners. Um, but it, you just obliterate it otherwise. And it's such a delicate, it's quite a nice, it can be quite a sweet flavor. It can be quite a meaty flavor. I really like it. So, you know, I, I see it as, um, in some cases, I would see it as a stock. In some cases, I could see it as used as like a pasta alternative, like something like sea spaghetti. It looks like spaghetti. Why not try using some of that? Um, it's more, there are different seaweeds around the coast and you could potentially use it as more of a local food source. So you're not necessarily having to um, import it, everything. And so they are seasonal. They, they have that seasonality. They do have different vitamins. They do have different proteins, but they all have different flavors as well. So that's what I kind of see it as is it's just adding a wee bit of something different. Yeah. I think I, I found, um, so I've been making a bit of a concerted effort to cook with it and use it all the time. And honestly, the best thing I have found to do with it is, um, well, two things. I've got a salt shaker that I've transformed into a, a seaweed shaker. Um, much to my, hu my husband's chagrin, because <laughs> every time he picks up something wanting salt, he picks up a seaweed one, but you know, he'll get used to it eventually. Um, and the other thing I found it really useful for is um, if you're trying to make a sauce, popping it in a sauce, it has a really, really amazing thickening effect. Um, so you don't need to wait for ages for things to boil down because um, the seaweed is going to re release um, probably alginates, I think, um, and make that sauce a bit thicker without you needing to kind of really reduce and make it almost nothing to get the thickness that you need. So the texture ends up being really, really, really good. Um, what do you use it for at home? Um, at the moment, I am mainly just adding it as a, I, I've got a, quite a tub that I got from Mara and it sounds like I'm selling them, but I've got this tub of sm their applewood smoked dolls. And every time I cook, just a bit goes in, just a wee bit. 
I mean, the other thing that um, has been promoted for quite a few of the species is the iodine content, because generally we are an iodine we suffer as a population from iodine deficiency and iodine is really important, especially in uh, the uh, brain development for children. So having some of this in, um, yeah, so I, at the moment I mainly use dulse and I mainly use it instead of adding salt or anything, but I use it just so it adds a bit of a, a meaty edge to it. Um, when I have my own blades dried, um, I've got, I could show you the cupboard. Um, I've got a whole top shelf cupboard. So um, I use... A picture of it. <laughs> it's a mess. Um, but I use dulse. I use, mainly use dulse or lava, and I'll just add it to sources. So when I make, used to make my own pizza, I haven't made it for a wee while, but I would make a kind of vegetarian or vegan um, meat sauce. Mm -hmm. And that is just adding onions, mushrooms tomatoes so those are the ones that have high umami but then you add the dulse to get the meatiness to it and then slow cook it for ages and it breaks down and you get that nice uh, flavor so usually i add lava or dulse to to stuff um i have been known to make carrageen puddings so i use the carrageenan uh, so carrageen which is irish moss or false irish moss and i'll make uh, puddings but the other day uh, because i was feeling a bit poorly i actually just made a hot milk drink with uh, some old dried carrageen that i had in the cupboard and uh, some honey and so i had a honey milk and carrageen drink because the carrot that is a traditional that is a traditional uh, cold remedy Apparently, wait in scotland mm. or yeah, uh, Scot Scotland, uh, West Coast Scotland, and well, Scotland and uh, Ireland. Did it work? I probably needed to do it more than once, but I only had enough for one portion. I don't know, it might have helped. All right, next time I feel, next time I get ill. Um, so let's talk about the industry, the wider industry, um, mm -hmm. if that would be all right with you. Um, so what's the, in your opinion, like, in the near term, like, say, this week, this month, what's the biggest um, hurdle you see like the industry needs to tackle um, at this moment? Oh, um, I, I think some kind of more firm regulatory framework. Mm -hmm the licensing is kind of like it, i mean it does de it depends on which industry you're going into i think with the food it would be nicer to have like everything has to be tested but it'd be nice to have agreed levels because like other terrestrial plants seaweeds do take up um heavy metals so heavy metals are a key discussion point so it's a problem with the um, bivalves as um like mussels and stuff as well but the key one with seaweeds is always the heavy metals and there aren't any kind of accepted standards for that quite i mean there are some um but they're more guidelines rather than set necessary set standards so we kind of been working on what the french do or and even the eu it's not a uniform um set standard so i think that <laughs> The licensing is kind of fine, but it's not quite fit for purpose because it's not quite specific. It's based on, in Scotland, it's based on mussel farms mainly and with a bit of fish farms, whereas it, that's not quite adequate really in some ways. And it takes a wee while. People don't really understand seaweed farms and part of the licensing approach is going, what is what are going to be the impacts and so when you do public consultations on it people there's a lot of misinformation or unknowns and so i think a bit more regulatory framework support of actually what you need to include in your plan what is actually essentially necessary for a license application and what is like a bit more optional and and that's in help. that it would be using it as a food um, um the the testing is more for food but for the actual just putting in the farm um i think also maybe having greater intermediary 
sort of optional steps because there's there's companies that are using extract from seaweeds and then there are people who are growing the seaweed but then there aren't many things in the middle where it's like okay we can process and we can do this to this seaweed or because not every grower and farmer is going to be able to say run a extraction for say alginate or dry it and then grind it for food or whatever so not every grower is going to be wanting to necessarily develop their own uh, products they will but sometimes they'll have excess and then not every and the thing is at the moment a lot of people are using seaweed but there isn't the supply quite yet so there's people wanting the seaweed but the growers are like well who am i selling it to and the people developing a product aren't quite at the stage of buying large quantities so that's where the main hold up is is that it's the supply to meet demand and the fact that we call it the seaweed industry and there are vast numbers of end products there are so many different species that could be used it's not quite all connected up yet right. it's, a, it's a jigsaw puzzle that's getting there but without the final picture to see it so i think it would be fair to say probably from both of our experiences that the uh, seaweed industry is in its very young early stages especially well in europe for sure in Asia, it's more developed, though, right? Yeah, Asia of Asia is uh, it's well developed and well established, and it just is. Um, Norway are in lead in Europe. The UK are languishing, and we've got a coastline that is fantastic. We are behind France, Denmark, Norway, Ireland, potentially even Germany. They've got quite a good tank based cultivation in some places. They've got they've got companies that are well established and coming over here asking for seaweed. You know, so the, there are companies, there are market and there are people buying seaweed to eat in Germany and uh, Netherlands. And they, some of these companies are now starting to need more supply. And they're like, well, we want it from here. Um, the, the UK is one of the highest consumers. We are the highest consumer of nori in Europe. I don't think we're quite the highest in the others, but we are certainly the highest consumer of nori. So that's, I mean, I guess that's kind of, that's interesting to me that we're languishing, but we also eat a lot of seaweed as a, as a nation. So it feels like we should yep. push forward with that a little bit. Yep. Um, <laughs> So, uh, what do you think we should do? Do you think we should, uh, we should ask for better regulation? Do you think it's just going to happen because, you know, there are, lots of <sighs> people, there are lots of people who are trying to buy it and eventually those holes will get filled in? I don't know. Um, I mean, the other thing is a lot of people are trying to I don't know how much thing is there's a lot of people scope for working together and cooperation mm -hmm. and then there's a lot at the same time people are like oh yeah we could collaborate and we could cooperate and then people are still quite secretive um and admittedly i'm probably not that secretive i'm quite happy to just go I'd share say ideas yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> i feel pretty open yeah yeah but you know i, I just see that i don't I felt that there was a way that the seaweed industry developed that wasn't the traditional linear. I, I'm quite keen on the circular economy, mm -hmm. like extracting as much as possible. And so the cradle trade on idea now, obviously growing something and when you cut, cut it, it dies. But the fact is that that can still feed back into um, an ecosystem of some kind. So it's like, well, okay, it can either feed us, which is fine, uh, but then you might still get some waste. It's like considering where that waste goes, and it's also considering this where it's growing and everything. It's taking into account everything and trying to make sure that stuff is circulating back in and not just going, being used up and then chucked away and not. Yeah. So, angle, oh, sorry. Logical perspective as well, because there's you know seaweed is great food. It grows naturally in in salt water you know most of the ocean most of the world are covered in that doesn't need any extra nutrients um and you know we could also use waste to kind of for for a more more ecological less wasteful um approaches 
So I wonder if um, one of the things that make, really excites me about us, the seaweed industry, and this may turn out to be absolutely untrue, um, is that there's potential here to grow it in a way that's great for a whole bunch of people that helps the environment, doesn't hurt it, and can be um, very efficient in terms of the different uses it can have and then what we do with it along the way. Um, have you have you seen much evidence of the ecological impacts that like a, far, a seaweed farm can have? Is there? I have not, oh, honestly. Um, oh, hang on. That's a bit of my working on the in, really interesting intertidal project and just put in some small test stru structures, mainly to test the uh, the materials. It's kind of a material testing, but seeing if what, because what kind of aiming to grow currently don't have a hatchery for. And so seeing if we can weld seed with different, what weld seeds on these structures. And the initial surveys came back as no negative impact on biodiversity, which is wonderful. Um, but what we actually saw was a change in abundance of a few species, um, especially the mobile species. So we saw an increase uh, in periwinkles. So little sn sea snails, uh, their numbers increase. And it's, it's quite a complicated picture. Um, but it just means that a lot more grazers came into uh, a certain area. So grazers are what you call secondary producers, and they are generally, so you, your seaweed is like your grass, um, and your grazers are like your, the snails in this case, are more like your sheep or something, but all habits, and you know, they are the basis of the rest of the food webs and food chains. So that's quite exciting. Um, other farms, as far as I can, I know some of the research has generally showed that kelp farms of they, they they haven't done it on the massive kelp farms yet, but they've shown that there's no environmental kind of ecological negative impact. Weirdly, in Sweden, they found that there was a weird cultural negative impact, which I'm not totally sure. Yeah, I can't remember what the final reading of that was. It was generally overall it was a positive. The seaweed farm was a positive, but there was a social or cultural negative impact, and I'm not totally sure what that was, and it seemed a bit weird. So, yeah, interesting. So I would say that there are ways to do it that I think probably are better than others. That that this is the this is the crux. It's there's a lot of talk of basically to make it worthwhile you need to do mega farms you need to really huge farms which might sort of then start watching the seaweed industry go down the route of the salmon farming industry which is what we kind of want to avoid um i can only really speak for scotland there is sometimes a bit of it feeling that what they're waiting for is because there are big companies out there already doing seaweed farming or international companies because we're far behind there are companies from obviously china even canada uh and now sort of looking at norway and so there is a bit of a feeling that they're kind of waiting for someone to come in with all the monies and set up the farms and so they can say oh look we've got the industry growing because sometimes scotland has historically not necessarily been brilliant at starting uh an industry it's just the renewable the wind farm industry sort of was doing well mm -hmm. uh it's one of the rare success stories but it's not brilliantly success story because it's still a lot of this is going to make me sound really bad but going on a lot of foreign investment but it, it'd be more it's like it'd be nice if it was more sometimes homegrown companies as well doing stuff because sometimes if it's an overseas company coming in some of that i know it comes down to money but some of that money is not then getting recircled back into Right. the places that it needs to and that's the problem with salmon farming is sometimes you've got the salmon farm but then oh it's providing jobs that money is not necessarily going into the communities they are doing better at it and they are trying to do better at it but initially it's not necessarily just the social licensing aspect of it which is what people are now focusing on and the more social acceptance of having some farm or something is more than just going, well, does it create jobs? Right. And look, 
it's more going well okay what else does it bring to the community rather than just jobs can you also then say you're going to be actively part of the community does it mean that it's supporting other um activities and stuff like that anyway sorry that's me rambling on <laughs> so I, think, I think um it feels like an enormous opportunity i know you know the two of us are both convinced of this um but it, as a very very new industry especially to the uk and honestly i think that scotland is far ahead of the rest of the uk um in terms of the number of farms and the research that's happening there the how it is to get a license um but i think this feels like a big opportunity and i agree with you that it would be nice for that to be something that is is beneficial to the UK as much as it can be um, and for that to be true it mostly needs to be companies that are you know somewhat based here and if you if you live it um, you know you're applying for an innovate UK grant or if you're trying to do to get funding um, for any kind of research it's there the questions they're always asking and even trying to set up a bank account um, you know a business bank account here the questions are always is this going to be in the UK? Are you going to use UK suppliers? Is this going to, how many suppliers do you need outside of uh, outside of the country? And the answer to those questions in the, in the context of seaweed is like almost everything needs to come outside of the UK because this is really happening here. Yet. So, you know, I think, it, I think it's a huge opportunity and I would be really sad to see, um, see the UK miss out on innovating in this space um, when, the opportunity is still here. It's still very, very, very early for, for um, the EU and um, anywhere outside of Asia really, in this industry. <laughs> um, so, but you know, we're on the same page there. So we're kind of we're just in an echo chamber, as it were. Yeah, that's the uh, yeah. But I think in this case, it's kind of a bit of a good echo chamber um, because. I think there's a lot of noise that can come come in from outside still um it's nice to it's nice to meet and talk to people who sort of have the same worries and then the same i uh, vision because we're not the only ones there are others who can go and people who actually have farms in the water who sort of share the same slightly the the same concerns and uh that and share the same idea of how it could and should necessarily benefit and i would say actually crown state scotland have recently published a report in that where they talk about going well though there seems to be a focus doing maybe a few big farms because there's a lot of community interest what we might see is a lot of small farms and so bringing those together to be able to unify that kind of supply to meet the demand of big people who have big demands and um, so there are some companies that will have big demands for um different seaweed then that might be in that kind of cooperative idea is not necessarily a bad thing and that's crown state scotland so they're at least open to the idea of going we might actually not it might not be socially acceptable to have big farms because people might not want to see such huge structures off the off their coast and this is west coast scotland admittedly it's a bit different possibly on the east coast um just because you could potentially do stuff further offshore uh, on the East Coast just because the water doesn't get quite as deep. Right, yeah. I mean, I think, um, and I don't know if you agree with me on this one, the, um, we've talked about food. I agree that there's a lot of um, a lot of potential, a lot of potential for a food market that doesn't need enormous farm that could have lots of smaller players and the amount of money that they could make from, from that market would be and it should be more than enough for it to make sense for them. Um, I think if you're thinking about other uses of seaweed, because we talk about food mostly, but um, seaweed can also be used for um, creating packaging. It could be used as a biofuel if, if you could get it right. Um, it could be used as animal feed. It can be used as soil fertilizer. Um, but you need, in most cases, the economics to make. You probably do need to be done at scale. Um, because the, the, the price that people will pay for bio gas is quite low. <laughs> the price that people will pay for animal feed is slightly less low, but you know, le less certainly than human food. Um, and I, I think in those cases, it, it probably it would be hard to do it in coastal waters 
it would be hard to do it, you know, close to the door because there are so many other water users around and, you know, it'd be a, a shame to, to claim the whole or big parts of the area for, um, for seaweed growth. That said, um, I recently have been reading um, David Attenborough's book, um, he, the one he released uh, last year, um, A Life on Earth, or A Life on This Planet, um, my witness statement. And in it, he directly addresses aquaculture and, um, and strongly recommends for fishing and breeding, uh, or the breeder breeding of fish, um, that we take massive chunks of the ocean and turn it into no fishing bones because it actually, in places where they have done that, it has massively increased the amount of fish that is available after some time. So it, I think it took, there's a, a place in Mexico where they just shut down fishing completely for about 10 years in, in large areas of the coast. And they've seen over 10 years, a massive increase in the number of fish that is available um, to fishing in the non-restricted non, um, zones, where as the fish are you know, multiplying, moving and leaving those areas going out. And, and in it, he also talks about aquaculture being a big part of this and um, he talks about um, sea growing seaweed and like ocean forest as he calls um, he calls the uh, the seaweed farmers um, which I think is a really a really nice term for it and I, part of me wonders if um, you know over the long term if it is indeed proven that seaweed farming is good for biodiversity um, that you could combine um, you could combine sort of nature reserve zones where you're trying to increase fish biodiversity um, in order to long-term benefit the fish industry uh, if, if seaweed farming could play a part in that um, and like I think it could but you know I think we probably need to see a lot more evidence that it's good for the environment around where so yeah the, that's the thing is generally the idea is that seaweed farm still is pretty good they did some good research in ireland as well about it um but because even though you're just creating a very temporary habitat what well, it's grows for in the sea for six months um maybe seven months max and then you're removing it this is if it's cows and you you do immediately create this temporary habitat where no fishes will come in it's it's so the why it's such an important temporary habitat it's not that similar to like seaweed rafts you actually do get a lot of broken off seaweed and you do get um this is so important it's weirdly people don't always think about it but you do get quite a lot of seaweed floating around in the water and it's usually egg rack but you get these rafts and maybe um logs and twigs and now marine litter sadly but floating around these like shadowed rafts are really important little nursery grounds and like little shelters because it stops stuff necessarily being able to hunt easily coming up underneath and it's like a little hideout so nothing can get small a small fish and what they have found in some common sometimes commonly caught in uh, some seaweed farms are lump, uh, juvenile lump suckers um, and if you ever really want to see a cute cute fish a baby lump fish is actually really really adorable it's just like a little ball of chubby it's so cute it's like a little cute and chubby and they just eat all the time they're wonderful um yeah um, lump suckers are wonderful uh interesting but anyway um so now this is where actually licensing and regulation might need to be not quite flexible so um i know you and i have recently been interested and having a fun time uh, looking at uh, how it's done in England and we know that the regulation there is really far behind it is not suited for doing seaweed farming in Scotland we're starting to try and push the <laughs> challenge them with um, integrated multi-trophic aquaculture which is simply per IMTA is growing more than one species together so it's usually like um, something like fish bivalves and seaweed or just by bi um sorry bivalves mussels and seaweed or fish and seaweed or fish fossil sea and anything like that is known as IMTA and it just means that you've got different um things growing together that one's like a carnivore and one's just a, a grass and one's a filter feeder or something anyway so there's been a lot of work on that in Canada but we're starting to see the interest in it over over here 
And so the other thing about the licensing operation is generally they ask you if you're going to remove um, what your methods are. And no one's really has the idea whether there'll be uh, regulators would be necessarily happy if you left something in the water for a bit. So a line, like um, I kind of like the idea of calling it a seaweed hedge. Now this is my, I, I will uh, confess this is my idea, but it's basically a seaweed hedge. So we know how important hedgerows are mm -hmm. in our round crops in terms of supporting local biodiversity and local animals. Now, if you just created a line that you just left in the water, just to act as a permanent little reservoir because you don't forget you are you grow something in the water and then you're removing a habitat you don't know whether that is necessarily a bad thing in the short term it seems to be quite a good thing because you still get the biodiversity but at the same time in the long run is that necessarily a good thing or is that necessarily a bad thing and if you just left something in the water for a bit isn't that going to be a good thing because you're just creating that extra habitat that might have been damaged and lost elsewhere the other thing which is just what i've just thought and when you're talking is about fisheries is that when you apply for license you're always applying for an area that is bigger than you're actually on a farm so you go for the crown state lease in the uk and that is usually a really big area compared to the actual area that you're going to of water surface that you're going to farm so you apply for the lease for a bigger area and you farm within that um, and it's usually up to a certain size but if you have this area why not it, there is a chance in seaweed farming you're going to have to follow it just like in agriculture or in fish farming because you're going to start seeing disease build up one of the key concerns is we still don't we know that seeds suffer from disease we know it's a major problem in in nori in the nori industry in the kelp industry in the uh countries that grow gema and capophycus which is the biggest source of carrageenan uh, which is a really important it, you find carrying in everything so you, you will have if you've cleaned your teeth today you have used carrageen um it is in toothpaste it is in ice cream it is everywhere if you are drinking vegan friendly beer it's being probably being used to clear the beer because previously it was gelatin and now they're using carrageenan and there are other things they can do but carrageenan is quite a good one as well anyway um but there's diseases that affect seeds and it might be that we're going to have to start considering you do crop rotation, so different, maybe more than one crop, and you might have to do fallow areas. Now, if you ask for a big area, you could probably still allow. Licensing doesn't always do this, but if you could say, all right, well, we're going to have a farm here, and you have, we're going to farm this area for so long, and then we're going to farm this area for so long, and this area can be used for fishing, whilst the farm's over here, and that might also work. In, in sand farming, you have to leave a site fallow after, I think, three years or something. You leave the site fallow for like a year so that the, any disease and... and then, sorry? Fallow is a, a resting area. So like yeah. A field that's just not used. Not yeah. With a cover crop or something. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, that's there. I mean, I love the hedgerow idea. And I, I'm, I'm a big fan of anything that ties seaweed farming and... and um, you know, multi-species um, aquaculture back to aquaculture, um, uh, agriculture, even. Um, because I think that, um, you know, when you when you think about how long we've been farming on land for, and you compare where we are in, in the sea, it's, it, we're, we're millennia apart. And um, there are a lot of lessons, I think, from, from agriculture, you know, certainly doing what you can to, to maintain the habitats that already exist is a, is a really big one. Um, but there, I think there are lots and lots and lots of people working at um, aquaculture to learn from agriculture. So, see Pedro's for the win. Yeah, you know, let's all set something down and just leave it as a, like you're not actively farming, you're just leaving lines in for a year or something. You're not actively growing anything, you're just letting it, the site uh, rest because you are, upsetting well you're not upsetting but you are taking nutrients and you just you don't you just don't we just don't know but it would seem sensible to do a fallow because that's what the you generally do in farming or you should do in farming and it's certainly what you do in uh salmon farming just leave a site just leave it if you 
some farming is mainly because you've done a negative impact and the environment <laughs> needs to recover. But in we don't know in sea beach farming, so why not? Right. We it hasn't tried. <laughs> Well, let's go and try it. Um, amazing. Well, thank you so much. On that note, I think um, we're, we're just, just about running out of time. Um, so it's been fascinating to chat to you as ever. Um, I hope that anyone watching or listening to this um, has found it equally interesting. Um, if anyone wants to get in touch, um, there is a contact form on the, on the website. And um, I'd love to hear from, from anyone. If anyone has any questions, me or for Duncan, um, you know, please feel free to reach out. Um, have a lovely day, everyone. Thank you.